Hello! It's time for this week's comment response. And in answer to someone's question about where last week's comment was, that was well, areas which I the June period to give you some extra <sighs> because I'm going to be wandering all over the place in June. Let's start off with the live and the comments to the live. The Singtao. If January 1939 Singtao incident leads to war. Uh, nice to hear you from one. Yeah, Hood was is the symbol of the British Empire. Scrapping her would be tricky given her reputation, which could have. A little, have a political lure, so frankly, they might have to name one of the new super battleships as an ex Atreus Hood. As Glenn McCleary delivery down responds, Hood was the flagship of the fleet. Warspike got scrapped despite being the most decorated ship to exit World Wars 1 and 2. The Navy would build a new flagship and send Hood off with a whimper. That's, you know, a nice way. The Royal Navy's had many ships which have been there. Glorious ships, great ships. Honestly, the survival of HMS Victory is more accident than intent. I would like that understood. The Royal Navy is not very good at preserving its history. I mean, Belfast survival is frankly a living, uh, absolute amazement to me. We're talking about a navy that produced the largest number of dreadnoughts on battleships of any navy in the world, and yet not a single one was preserved. Not a single one. Okay? If we consider the sheer number of frigates we had served, the sheer number of flag class corvettes, the sheer number of frigates we've had served since World War II, go look for the preserved examples. Any Leander class sitting around. The Royal Navy is incredibly bad at preserving its history. The British government as a whole is incredibly bad at preserving its history. So... Why this has come up, I'm not quite sure as a comment. Actually, no, I do remember it. it sort of got into the end of, oh, if Hood was in this, 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 they'd never scrap up. Well, yeah, they probably still would have. Yeah. There's just not much chance. There's always a possibility, not much chance. A 99 Iron Duke. So, an interesting comment. The Chinese used gladiators against the Chinese and certainly just shot down A5Ms with them. There's actually comments later on about that, and yeah. Never count out the fair and uh, never count out the, uh, the Gloucester Gladiator. It's a very nimble fighter. Okay, Glenn McLivery. And I have to admit, some of your comments I was looking at going, oh, really? Thinking over it, Germany and Italy would want to claim moral superiority. You're giving them, you're using modern diplomatic techniques to describe the period of the time. No, that's something which we do today as diplomacy. As diplomacy, not really something they tried to claim in those periods. You're, it's sort of claiming moral superiority is something which is attractive in the modern world. Wasn't really as much of a factor in the nineteen twenties and thirties, and certainly not a factor prior to World War One. France probably would stay out of it. No, they wouldn't, but we'll get into that in a second. But Portugal and Dutch, may, may every, and every small power would probably want in. So Germany and Italy would probably set up patrols for ships, most likely cruisers escorting transports, because they'd want to ensure their trade gets unmolested by the British. Except, of course, they'll be trying to make profits from Japan, whom they have close relationships. They don't have close... Re they, Japan, Germany, Italy do not have a close relationship in January 1939. You are looking at a period and you're presuming that the relationship shreds back. It doesn't. And so conflict aggression would build up until the British banned them from the Pacific, which might lead to conflict zone right, which it could letter leverage. But at the end of the day, I'm not sure that these social priors would happily allow a friendly to be entirely crushed and beaten up without reactions. But it comes down to personal motivations of two fascist leaders. Possibly Germany would seek to profit from the blockade, while Italian Navy would want national pride by joining the conflict against Japan. It could be amusing to impact the difference between those two leaders could butterfly from here. 
Later in the same day, pause for dinner, but the fact is the Japanese Navy and Air Force probably wouldn't suffer the same levels of depletion in the more manageable war. If their fleet remains closer to home, that means airfields exist for Navy fighter recovery. So kamikaze be less attractive, particularly when it's clear that even direct hits with small bombs are shrugged off. Presumably, they would go more all in with torpedo strikes rather than dive bomb tactics, except like Royal, who would need to work from a great distance to avoid detection as she'd be damaged far easier. Okay. Ark Royal doesn't have... Please note, Ark Royal doesn't have an armored deck, but she still has a steel strength deck as a flight deck. So she's damaged more easily than an armored carrier, but still is tougher than carriers which have wooden flight decks. My response. Trouble for France is if they stay out, then Britain might not support them in other things. Basically, they have to go if, with Britain if they don't. Uh, if they don't, then if war if Germany broke out, Britain might go as well. Plus, of course, you have to remember the French territory land is actually closer to the uh, to Japanese advance than British is. So French in the China is more likely to be invaded than uh, than British Singapore and British Malaya. The Japan can get to there. Well, their army can actually get to there across the Chinese border. They can't get to Malaya or Singapore without getting a lift down that. Britain might go, well, we fought a war and you didn't help us. As for the rest, the fascist past, whilst I can see your logic, they don't have that at the basis. They don't have the ships to do any of those sort of things of that scenario. You, you're talking about neutrality patrols. Where are they going to base them from? Where are they going to operate them from? Where are they going to do them from? They could make the statement, but... You're going to say, I'm going to operate a neutrality patrol, but I'm going to operate it from Singapore or Shanghai. Not happening. We're in a war zone. Sorry. You have to have bases to operate your neutrality patrols from. Um, and at this point, Japan is not an ally of theirs. Whereas joining in on the side of Britain and France Act, even if they don't do much, can provide for a lot of opportunities to learn and cover for their own military build-ups. Plus, as mentioned, Singtao for Germany and Grand Stranding Field Duce. So there are many major advances. Glenn McGarry, final thoughts. Um, the war, the war would show the need for high, high firepower anti-air, so a mixture of 40mm, 4.5 inch, and some heavy out at high altitude AA that can fit the British sensing, uh, sensing fuse would be desirable. So possibly 6 inch long barrel secondaries would become standard. Potent enough to sink cruisers, yet possessing the velocity needed to hit next generation level bombers and bl blow low altitude aircraft out of the sky of a single round. And they're already, already developing the 5.25, so I doubt they'd go for the 6 inch. A new escort class of battlecruiser would appear, armed to the teeth of AA, radar, radio, and fire directions, and possibly fighter launching rails for rapid response. I'm not sure where you're going with this, and I will respond by it, but I basically have been saving the full response for, for the comment response. All capped off with rapid loading 12 to 14 inch turrets to blow through the magazines of any warship, not a modern battleship, with a rate of fire to terrify any battlecruiser or radar it could possibly meet. Meanwhile, the slower dedicated battleship can mount 18-inch cannons and armor to slug it out of anything it might meet with accurate if slow, deliberate volleys. Such a battleship might come with one uh, with one lighter 12 to 14-inch turret to monitor the fu uh, fall of shots to enable uh, ensure reliable ranging shots without wasting the first broadside volley at combat ranges. Mostly because I doubt 18-inch 18, 18 we uh, weapons could reach out far enough to touch warships at combat range, effective range, and missing a first barrage would be extremely costly, particularly for in ranges and are higher enough dispersal is concerned. Okay, the reason you stand by on guns is because the operating characteristics of a 14 inch shell and the ranging characteristics of an 18 inch shell are very different. Once you're dealing with different shell types, those different shells, etc., it's very, very difficult to try and get the ranging details from one type of gun to another type of gun, which is why you stopped having mixed batteries of main armament and why you stopped having mixed batteries altogether. The whole point of the Dreadnought was to make the life of range, long range combat easier. So you use a single turret. So you might use one of your triple, if you have, let's say, 18 inch guns and you, let's say, you have 12 18 inch guns in four, four triple turrets. You might use one or two turrets to do ranging shots. Once you have the range, you bring in all the, all the turrets. You're not going to use a different gun. It's logistically a nightmare. And aiming-wise, it doesn't help you at all. My response mainly cost around the Battlecruiser one because I didn't want to be too rude. Or rather, too come across the route because I'm too going, no, that won't work, no, that won't work. And that's one of the things. I do always remember when I comment 
you're just getting the words. When I comment in terms of video, you get the facial expression, you get the tone of voice, everything else. It's far easier to be no than it is to be. Because I can come around and say, no, you're stupid, when I'm not meaning, no, you're stupid. I'm going, no, I can understand where you've got this logic from, but the reality is, no. It, were, it sounds great on paper. Reality, no. So it's the difference between going, no, you're stupid, and doing, no, I know where that's coming from, but no, please, no. <laughs> the nightmare of organising and making that, trying to make that work, please, no. There's a difference. But the trouble is, written, they can come across as very similar. Interesting ideas, but I don't think fighter launch rails honestly carrying cap would be easier, especially when you consider the problems caused by aviation fuel storage. Honestly, that is a fire hazard when you cannot really protect, and that interferes a lot with AA placement on radars, so I don't think the benefit would be felt to outweigh the cost, especially with more carriers entering service. Glenn McCrimmy. I mostly feel that the rail launch fighters were, were useful in convoy escort and could allow a battlecruiser to deploy cap against low altitude torpedo strikes while the carrier is busy dealing with recovery or launching a strike package or dealing with a hit and crash by getting a download. The ability to getting something, anything into the air to make incoming Japanese think twice about a strike rather than granting precise time and in particular the ability to launch regardless of carrier proximity wouldn't be probably considered useful. No, it wouldn't because you've, there, you've just said you've got a, cru a battlecruiser on convoy escort. Any convoy which is big enough, to, uh, valuable enough to require to have a capital ship, battleship or cap battle cruiser as escort, is going to get an aircraft carrier as escort. In fact, you're more likely to get an aircraft carrier than a battle cruiser, because the British already have escort carriers, or as they would probably term it, a cruiser carrier, because you have cruiser, fleet, and strike carriers in British doctrine at this point. Okay, cruiser carriers are things like Hermes, Argus. You could argue to an extent Eagle. They are for convoy escort. That is their job. That is what they do. Sea control. Sea tr They're going to be there. A lot. It's a lot cheaper and easier to build those. And British have plans for escort carriers. I know they take a long time to get around to actually building them in World War II. They really do. And it annoys the life out of me that they take so long. When you have considered this is a nation which has been looking at small carriers for a long time at this point. But they do have the plans, and so I think they probably produce those. Rather than having, and also, again, for convoy escort, you're going to use your old battleships. You're not going to use your brand new battle cruisers. You have other things you'd want to do with them. And that's presuming these things actually enter war, in into service in time to be part of the war. Certainly would have had some problems and risks, and it would end up in, uh, eat up valuable internal volume for some kind of hangar to launch fighters via catapult. Again, you'll be launching seaplane fighters because you have to recover them. Or are you going to somehow recover to the nearest carrier? Because if there's a carrier near, near enough by for them to fight and then recover to, there's a carrier near enough by, by for them to operate from. But when the carrier is busy and a cap is doing offensive strikes, the whole point is, with the British structure and the whole policy the British have, is the cap would be maintained. Uh, that there would, you're not sending all the fighters off. The, you're, to, you're, you're putting American alpha strike doctrine in the place of British perpetual strike doctrine. There is a reason the British go for perpetual strike, because perpetual operations allow them to maintain a perpetual cap. And that's a key point. If you're operating in the Mediterranean, if you're operating in the South China Sea, if you're operating in areas which are going to be in range of land-based aircraft and large concentrations of land-based aircraft, you have no idea when they're going to turn up, especially pre-radar. So you have to keep fighters up. But when the carrier's busy and her cap is doing offensive strikes and a torpedo wing spotted just around, an extra six fighters launched in the right direction while the carrier is at its most vulnerable, trying to offload the next strike package... Again, why do you only have one carrier in this scenario? Why are you... Uh, the, the whole point about this scenario I said was that actually the British could follow through their interwar doctrine of multi-carrier operations because they could concentrate the carrier fleet. So again, if you did have that big strike package going out and you did want to send some fighters through, they probably come from one carrier and the other carrier would have its fight be providing the fighter events. I can see it being declared not a requirement based on real combat experience. No, actually, real combat experience from World War II and all the other operations was take the aircraft off the capital ships as quickly as possible. They're a fire hazard. 
why do we have we keep some around for actually communications for moving admirals between ships but actually get them as far away from the ships as possible put them on the all on the carrier Particularly given the fact that British carriers and escort will have to draw, withdraw for resupply and restowing, uh, restowing quite as often as they did in World War II, historically. I'm not sure where you've got this from. Okay, uh, you've got the British carriers withdrawing to restow. Where do you think they withdraw to? And what do you think the fleet does in that time? The fleet tends to go with the carriers, and the carriers... Withdrawing, where do you think they withdraw to? They withdraw back to Alexandria, etc., where they go for resupply, as most ships do? Because you, you then if you're talking about in the Pacific Fleet, well, yes. World War II, the British cannibalize their resupply fleet. And, you, you know, you've got HMS Unicorn is delayed and it's first used as a light fleet carrier rather than a support carrier and all sorts of things. Because of World War II and the way it works out. But if you look at the doctrine for fighting a Pacific War, especially considering Unicorn is under construction, so if they push through the Unicorn's construction as well, you'd have had a whole carrier, of an aircraft whose whole, well, a forward aviation support ship, whose principal job was to carry aircraft forward to the carrier groups and bring them back. And bring that and sort of repair other ones, etc. That's her purpose. And that's what she'd be doing. That's what Unicorn would be doing. That's what the British would probably be using, uh, probably using again, Argus and, to an extent, Hermes might be being used for as well in this scenario. Also, what are they convoying up that's requiring a battle cruiser escort at that point? Because the whole point of the war plan, as I went through it, was a very slow movement forward, which basically is degrading and taking away fuels, imports, and everything from... Japan to stop them being able to operate and do things. The carrier can recover the airframes, use fleet escorts as limited supply of new airframes, pilots, although I admit you probably need to stifle the cap pilots between warships when practical and ensure everyone keeps up their landing practice instead of getting overconfident, and also act as a reserve fighter wing for cap deployment of short notice. You're making life far more complicated, and you're also building a whole scenario which doesn't need to exist. Which covers the three of the armored carrier weaknesses. Limited storage, limited deck space, elevator capacitor, limited endurance. Okay. Um... So. This is the point at which I realize what, you're, what you've been reading and what you're thinking about. Because I know where those phraseologies in that direction about armored carriers come from. And I won't use the phraseology I tend to use about it. Which is basically hindsight, hindsight, and hindsight. Or rather, limited storage. No, they actually managed to keep their aircraft operation. When you have a scenario that the uh, in, uh, limited storage often put up to give me this point about the Mediterranean, when you go, well, you know, these ships didn't have enough storage for uh, spare parts, etc., well, they did have enough storage for spare parts. What the British Royal Navy weren't expecting was the RAF to hoover up all the spare parts because of the Battle of Britain. And they were. And all the spare parts and all the spare engines, spare Merlins, everything was being hoovered up. Which is why the Royal Navy has constantly having issues with getting its aircraft operating Mediterranean because all the spare parts aren't leaving Britain. They're staying there. That's not a carrier's fault. It's got plenty of storage for operational needs. You just need to resupply it. That's a fault of the supply scenario and the sheer infrastructure construction. Again, not a problem which appears in this scenario. Limited deck space elevator capacity. They're designed for the British aircraft that are. Yes, they can't take the uh, the aircraft which grow and they have to uh, have they have trouble with taking as many of the larger aircraft that come out at the end of Second World War. But for the aircraft they're designed for, they're fine. And for the aircraft the Royal Navy and British were designing for, they're fine. Limited deck space. Again, the British are not doing an alpha strike. Down. The British are not doing an alpha strike. That's not the British doctrine. Okay? So, every time someone says they're not, they're not able to do the deck parking, well, they don't build deck parking, for instance, 
on most airships because if they're operating in the North Atlantic, they get tend to get swept off the aircraft. And they do deck parking, etc. in the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean when they want to, in the, in the Pacific sometimes. But um, they don't do that as much because they're not doing the Alpha Strike. That's not their operational doctrine. That's American doctrine and Japanese doctrine, which works for their operational scenarios. But it doesn't work for the British operational scenario and the British uh, idea of how to operate. And so this is, yes, they might like to have larger carriers so they could have the option of doing an Alpha Strike if they wanted, but it's not necessary. If they wanted, if they really had been assessed with doing an Alpha Strike, they would have designed their carriers around it. And as, again, for the elevator capacity, the only way you can get really around that is if you build deck edge elevators, deck edge lifts. And the British didn't want to do that. They liked building centerline ones. Again, because of the North Atlantic, but also because of building an armoured carrier scenario and trying to keep it in an armoured box. And they thought it better to have the gaps in the centre of the ship where they could be all they could be a bit protected rather than on the sides and the edges of the ship. But they were considering that. And they didn't yeah, so it was it's a decision. As for limited endurance, well. We have the illustrious class range, 10,700 nautical miles at roughly 10 knots. Yorktown class range, 12,500 nautical miles at roughly the same speed. Oh, that's so onerous. They can only do 10,000 nautical miles. They can only carry enough food for themselves to be at day sea for 30 days. And of course, the British can also do replenishment at sea and have been doing it for a long time. Sample blockades during the Napoleonic Wars, but also in World War One and World War Two, they can do replenishment at seas. And see, they don't need to when they're operating in the Mediterranean because you're not operating that far away from your base. You're not that long enough that you tend to need to do actually replenishment at sea. You don't need to in the North Sea either. North Atlantic again depends on how long you're operating for, but again. You don't need to. You need to when you're operating in the Central Pacific. You need to, to an extent, if you were going up from the, through the South China Sea and the British do have plans for it. But again, you are using what I would call... You're, you're doing the scenario which I often have with people come up when they read certain books and they read things. You're using the whole pears to oranges argument. An orange makes a terrible pear, and a pear makes a terrible orange. Honestly, Glenn, that's just... I know where you're coming from, but it's almost disheartening that I've been doing these videos for so long, and I've been... I know Jamie and Armored Carriers have been doing videos for so long on the Armored Carriers, on their realities, and yes, they do have limitations. But those limitations are not as massive as you seem to think they are. And they come with other advantages. And for both, it's half a dozen one six of the other. If I want to build the ultimate carrier for doing what the Americans are doing in the Pacific and for their way of war, I build a Yorktown class. Because that makes great that's a great carrier for that scenario under the treaties. If I want to build a carrier for the British that can do its fleet operational part of its doctrine, of its carrier doctrine, and its fleet carrier role in the Mediterranean and in the South China Sea and also Indian Ocean, North Atlantic, etc. I probably build an armoured carrier because that is what it does. For the strike carrier role, which is devised off from that role because the American the strike carrier is also sort of, is also kind of the alpha strike role, well, I have to build a different carrier. So really, if you're comparing that, you're to be if you're comparing around carriers which have a similar operational doctrine, you should be comparing Ark Royal with the Yorktowns. They're the similar they're the, they're built to the similar doctrines. But the fleet carriers are built to a different doctrine than Ark Royal is because one is built for fleet support and battle support and doing the operating in the Mediterranean, etc. And Clear the Mediterranean in the South China. Uh, clear the Mediterranean. Help out in the South China Sea, but in the Mediterranean it's supposed to do diving in, diving out. It's the Atlantic Ocean, that sort of area. 
which is actually sort of what it does with Force H. It does it goes both ways. I know where you're coming from, and it's soft and used to bash the armored carriers. But honestly, it's it's top Trump's history, and it's bad history. Because reality is not top Trump. As I said before, if I want to build a carrier for one operational doctrine, I know what I build. But if I'm doing another scenario, if I'm America, I'm operating across the Pacific. So look at those distances. Of course, I'm going to build a carrier like the Yorktowns. But if I'm the British and I'm coming up from this direction, across, you know, through the Mediterranean, across the Indian Ocean, up the South China Sea, look at that scenario. That's a very different scenario than operating across that way. And I'm going to build a different ship to deal with that. And the ship you build for that is not going to be necessarily the best ship for that. You'll use it for that, especially if you hold them in enough numbers. But you're going to build something different. Because your end goal and your solutions are different to your problem. You're dealing with a similar problem, but from different directions. And that's going to affect your methodology of how you deal with it. There isn't such a thing as, this is the perfect carrier, and therefore anything which doesn't match to this standard is limited, is terrible, is da-da-da-da-da. It's not. Martin Peacock, hello. I think we've got your live this afternoon. Uh, hope I find you well. A question on German Italian involvement in the war. While I do agree that both Germany and Italy would want to be involved in the war, would they actually be able to support their fleets operating in the Far East reasonably independently? Not much so. In fact, honestly, well, reasonably independently, uh, they would be having to operate from the Allied bases and they'd have to be supported. But mm, there would be a sort of independence of their ship would be part of that task group. The reason I ask this, if it's a Greaseman in particular, I have doubts about how much they could actually support of their own fleet, such will be. It is all well and good trying to claim the international prestige game, but if you require major support to do it, then that prestige is somewhat dampened. I would potentially see Hitler not wanting to lose face on the international scene by trying to send a fleet or even a couple of ships and having to rely on help from British or worse, yet the French to make it feasible. Also, would the Germans want the British and French taking a close look at their ships up close? I think... That's where you get the choice of which ships send. I don't think it'd be a Deutschland class. I think it would be uh, Neisenau is available. Scharnhorst isn't yet available, but Scharnhorst will soon will be available. So those are the two I think would to go. A fast capital ship is what they send, and you'd probably just send that. I think the alternative of sitting back and letting Britain and France get distracted in the Far East to make some more moves in Europe would be also be appealing. Would or could, what could be a funny scenario is Germany thinking it can take advantage of the situation and invade France while they're distracted. Yes, unlikely, but who knows? The law of avenging loss of to France in World War One outweighs the return of Sing Zhao. They do this on the day or just before the USA allies with Britain and France. I don't think they do it. Again, they're not ready to invade. This is most scenarios. The Germany in January 1939 is in an absolute terrible state for invasions. And there is a reason it takes them as long as it does before they actually do a war in the West. Before they actually do... That's why there's the phony war period. Because no one really does any moves. And that's because the Germans are reorganizing their forces still. The phony war is not for anyone's choice. It's because no one's actually ready to go to war. <laughs> it's freaking terrible. Freaking terrible. Uh, Geo Guy, would the British have to redeploy its three battlecruisers to the Far East to counter the Congos and would work on Vanguard and possibly follow on one starter? Eventually. But as I said at the beginning, at least the one other conflict, Renan is still in refit, not out, not due out till August, and Vanguard wasn't started until 1941. In this scenario, though, the King, King George V and Lions would not be paused, might even be accelerated, so it may not. So Vanguard itself may not exist in the end. That's a very real scenario. Matthew Skeeter. Dr. Clark, similar question, but at 60 meters range, can either the 6 inch or 18 inch guns of the cruisers depress far enough to hit the opposing magazines, or are they limited to superstructure shots, which will be murderous but may not sink the ships? Not really. They can only really depress the negative 5 degrees, but the sheer damage those shells would wreak, even at that range, would destroy the structure and integrity of the ships, and could well set off the magazines. It might not, and they might even be afloat afterwards, but they wouldn't be in any condition to be brought back into service. The point is. Let's put it this way. They're aiming to hit the ship and cause maximum damage. 
six inch shells get in a ship, even going at negative five degrees, they might actually bounce off the they go in structure, but they might bounce off the actual inside of the armor belt. Think about that. Bouncing off the inside of the armor belt and come and ricochet around inside the ship. Or who knows what explosions and damage they'll cause with their explosion. So it's just the sheer amount. Of, it's just, yeah, it damaged terrible. Jeff Ivey, did the math. 1,577 nautical miles divided by 24 hours equals 65 knots. I, I don't think it's quite that far, but uh, I, I know where you're coming from. I don't think it's quite 65 knots, but um, yeah. Jan, excellent video analysis, thank you. Uh, now, I want to solo war game this using the old SBI war in the Pacific game on Vassal after I backfit the force pool while using this information. Hmm, cool. Sean Nargan, not long ago, I got to see a Grum F3F flying barrel in an airshow. Great looking aircraft. It got me wondering how the US Navy would have done in 1939 against the IGN in the first year of both sides using a mix of biplanes and monoplanes and important 42 naval combatants not yet in service. So your presentation was in primary on the British scenario. I found it interesting. That said, in your scenario, I think Germany would have taken advantage of Britain's destruction of the Pacific to still invade Poland, reasoning the British wouldn't want to fight two wars at once. I also think Britain would have still have kept back a significant part of the fleet at home due to the Nazi problem. After seeing the rest of the Czechoslovakia annex, so a British Japan naval war wouldn't have Japan heavily outnumbered. And once Germany started their European war, Britain would have shifted the Pacific War to second priority like it did historically. Malaysia would have remained a hard nut to crack due to the lack of nearby land bases, but I think New Britain and Papua New Guinea would have tended towards the historical, uh, historical nearby Japanese island possessions, giving them the historical invasion launching points. The problem with your scenario is that it is uh, what is what is keeping the RN forces back for or back for. Sharnost is only commissioned on the seventh of January nineteen thirty nine. Nice now was May nineteen thirty eight, but still having issues with her training. Bismarck was only launched in February nineteen thirty nine. There is no German fleet in January 1939, especially with no war to justify staying back, as historically it is the Italian fleet, which is the big problem wise in the European, and even Vittorio Ven Vittorio Ven Vittorio Veneto aren't commissioned till May 1940. So to my mind, the R-Class, probably the unmodernized QEs, are left in European theatre, but that still gives Nelson, Rodney, Royal Oak, Hood, Repulse, and Warspite to be sent out with renown, Valiant, and Queen Elizabeth. Um... Uh, and it said initially, with renown, Queen uh, Valiant and Queen Elizabeth, probably King, perhaps King George V and Prince of Wales, although they might have been kept back to provide extra support with the Sharnos and the Notorious, joining before they push beyond Singapore. Plus, probably allied ships, the Dunkirks, most likely, there is a decent battle line. And as said in the video, I think it's highly likely the USN come along. Now, carrier deployments is different, because, but again, RN can afford to send the, big, the four big carriers. But as I stress, also stressed in the video, it doesn't matter how outnumbered, no matter how outnumbered the Japan is. Japan, is if the British plan is this to blockade, the Japanese plan is to wait for the enemy to come to them, time will work in favour of the British and against the Japanese, so by the time the British go in, it will be very different. As for the rest, well, if you have a war going on in the Far East, that will change the procurement pace, focus, readiness, and emphasis to engage forces. It will also the diplomacy of the uh, change the diplomacy of the British forces and their government. And especially should a grand alliance be formed, i.e. Britain and Empire in America, which is likely in this scenario, the metric for Germany changes. There is also the problem that even if Germany decides to do what it did originally, by that point, Japan is well and truly suffering. The blockade, submarines deploying from Singapore and elsewhere, are going to have taken their toll. The British Empire and Allies could well shift focus, but all that means is the blockade continues and Japan gets weaker and weaker. Those historical invasion points mostly built, were mostly built up in 1940 to be able to... Uh, to be able to do those uh, those invasions. Again, this would be war starting long before Japan is ready, and conversely, from an infrastructure perspective, in an area when, in January 1939, Britain is almost ready, something which is then undermined by two years of war. I hope that helps. Long Patrol comes out on Saturday. Sean Nordine again. I agree military Britain doesn't need a large fleet at home in 1939. I just question if the political will would be there, given that unfriendly neighbourhood. Honestly, the British government would prefer a war in the Far East than a war locally. And they'd love a reason to deploy it. Plus, it would give them a reason to break the treaties, which wouldn't break the treaty, which would enable them to just do a massive build-up. And they would have it justified without having to, you know. Also, as for the US getting involved, the reasons you give a value, but in order themselves, I wouldn't convince the majority of Americans of this area to be willing to go to war for them. But the Americans don't need to send large invasion forces. They're just a naval war. They could market this as a limited war. That's the thing. It would be marketed as liveable, and thus Congress won't vote for it. Congress hated Japan at this point. The thing is, Congress were looking for a war. The issues that they had in terms of being attacked and having the Panayan isn't, were not good for Japan. The US is going to need Japan to create an excuse that will convince people to support going to war. 
again, this is one of those things that comes back again. People look at Pearl Harbor and go, yes, Roosevelt was letting it happen because of an excuse, to need an excuse to go to war with Japan. No. I know that fits with people, and that fits with people wanting to believe that the Americans, to an extent, are all powerful. It's a kind of concert. It's kind of a condescending view. But no, the Americans' war with Japan was just as often muted as Britain, as British war with Japan, and it's come very, very close. And this scenario would be considered an absolute flagrant attack on a British warship. And it would be considered how long till the uh, till they attack us? Yes, we must. We'll go win with the British. The U.S. Uh, Japan, whether Japan conveniently does this on their own or the UN, U.S. manipulates them into doing so, is a big question. If only one of the old battleships like Texas would constantly blow up while visiting a Japanese island, you see, I've, I've talked about this before and there is of course that battleship I, I talked about this in, in relation to the um uh u.s uh, the the span uh, the span uh, the war between spain and america and a spanish-american war and the fact is that battleship blowing up wasn't arranged by anyone it was just so many issues with that ship. It's not it's not some sort of conspiracy theory. It's just bad maintenance going on. And bad management. And the fact there is it's taken advantage of and that is worthy of conspiracy. But the actual incident itself is an accident. Michael Cooch. Thanks for a very enjoyable informative session. Certainly had a couple of aspects that got me thinking. See my comments. Mm -hmm. I have a book recommendation for you, something which I think would be of interest to you considering this topic and considering the British Defence of Empire in the wider context of the 2030s. The book is The Imperial Military Geography of Major D.H. Cole, published by Sifton, Pred and Co. Limited first edition, published in 1924. I have the ninth edition, published in September 1957. Lucky find, picked up out of five at a war games convention. The forward states the primary aim of this book is to describe in geographical setting defence problems of the British Empire. Its second aim is to give a brief but adequate outline of forces immediately available to clear to bear the initial burden of these responsibilities and also take stock of the resources in manpower and material which might ultimately be mobilised for national and imperial needs. It's very well written and covers aspects of the imperial defence as well as British perceptions of how other powers view their own interests that I hadn't previously considered and which gives me a more round view of the subject. I think you find it interesting to... Uh, find this an interesting, valuable time. A books currently has nineteen thirty five edition of fourteen pound. I think it's worth investing. I probably will get a would get a copy. I have read a copy in library at King's a few years ago, but the problem is at the moment, honestly, tax bills. <laughs> um, as I've said before, I've been having some scenarios which are good. I've been earning more money through YouTube, etc., than I expected, and I'm paying tax on it because I'm honest. But also some issues with some of my employers and them making mistakes with paychecks, which I have pointed out the taxman about. And is, but it's basically a policy of the taxman, which I can understand, is I pay them money and then they pay me back when they get the money from the employers, like they're supposed to, because it's on my tax. And I'm sitting there going, uh, yeah, but that means I need to find the money from somewhere. So I have a huge book list, including that book now on it, uh, to get from uh, get from various scenarios, but it's um it's gonna be a while. Probably I won't be buying books till about the end of March because of making sure I have the money to cover the issues. And that's probably me oversharing, but that's you know I'm being honest. My cooch. Dr. Clark, maybe I misinterpreted you, but I find myself disagreeing with part of assessment on the likelihood of other powers, especially America, joining the war. I can see a reasoning why they'd want to. You need to be in the war to help the shed peace, you lose prestige in area of British win, and you aren't involved. But there are countervailing factors which you don't cover, which I think make foreign invention into war less likely. There's only so many hours. I, I, I was talking for 3 hours and 43 minutes and 40 seconds. Um, there, it, it's, it's not the equivalent of a 100,000 word book. Unless on the United States, whilst I agree that strategically the US would want to get involved for the reasons you say, it's not a simple due to domestic politics. There is still a strong isolationist feeling country. And if the bombing of a US warship, US dependence, didn't provoke war, it came very close. In fact, if the British hadn't helped smooth over things between the two, it would have been quite likely. Um, 
I can't see the sinking of British one doing so automatically. The US establishment may think it's worth a war, but but try telling uh, the great American public that little Johnny and hundreds of thousands like him have been killed in pres to preserve US prestige. It doesn't go well down well. I don't, again, see it. Remember, the whole British war plan, I think this would affect the Americans' extent as well, is the British war plan is a naval war. There isn't a mass ground mobilization. You don't need those thousands and thousands of troops. It's going to be naval warfare. And honestly, if you add the American Pacific Fleet into the British forces that would be likely to send in order to contain the Japanese and to slowly bring in that scenario, they don't probably need to deploy any extra forces at all. They just need to supply them. It could be a great, glorious victory with absolutely minimal effort. Why is FDR dragging us into Britain's war? Again, why should American boys die to the British Empire? The contrast between FDR's handling of the Panay, with US dead, US brought off, and Birmingham, no US involvement, US going to war, in some could be a very awkward election trail, and FDR is canny enough politician nerd. So my take on it is that Japan can provide the Kaz Belli, or the US can provoke or manufacture one, then the US gets actually actively involved, but until then I can't see the US becoming a belligerent. It's a similar case with France and Netherlands. What reason can they get, uh, give their public to go to war? They haven't been attacked, and there is no NATO-like treaty or automatically bring them in, so why should they go to war with us? How do they sell this to the man on the street? How do they justify this domestically? Russia is different. Stalin doesn't have to worry about pesky little things like elections, and I can see uh, opportunistic Stalin manufacturing incidents, an incident and giving him Casas Belli to join the war as an aggrieved party, should he see advantage to do so. No NATO, but there is a League of Nations, which gets the right a lot, but provides a framework for concerted action. And for both the Netherlands and France, there is the problem not only of their empires depending upon British naval strength at this point, because if Britain loses how long before their own territories get swallowed up, and let's be honest, the French is directly in the line of advance, but also if they don't assist Britain, then Britain might decide not to assist them in a European war or reach their own accommodation in Germany and Italy, something which the existence of the Anglo-German naval agreement had already raised in the minds of French leaders. Public opinion would not probably support mass troop deployments, but that's not asked for as part of this plan. The sending of their navies to take part in the operations would probably be acceptable, especially within the view of the glories they would surely win. And every ship would help. This might mean some heavy cruisers in Dunkirk from the French and access to the China bases. It might mean some cruisers and submarines from the Dutch. Remember, the British plan is total blockade, not total war. And so more cruisers, submarines, and a couple of fast battleships would be very helpful. As for America, well, considering the Panay incidents and others, they'd already experienced the hands of the Japanese, this would fit with the pattern of escalating violence. That could provide them with just cause, especially considering the efforts of the pro-British lobby in the USA. Although my own suspicion is that even if they did wait, the issues between the IJA and the IGN would soon lead to an event attacking them as well, probably on their forces on the Yangtze, who are most likely within weeks, if not days, of the attack on the British. Hello, Big Fluff. Okay. Fluffy research assistant just getting involved and telling me I need to get the drink some water if I'm going to keep talking. Now. <sighs> right then. Now, Andrew Cruz. Whee! Look at me commenting before the video is finished. I, look, I did put a point in the long patrol of the Singtown Wall to talk about commenting before the video was done. Uh, now, here is the reasoning for it. I won't say who, but one person edited a comment on a last What If Long Patrol nearly three dozen times. That's nearly 36 times. There actually was 34 times. Every time I had the reply ready, the comment had changed. This frustrated me somewhat, hence the point. Nice to go front. Definitely not me, as I only alter comments if I need to. Definitely. It wasn't you. Uh, you did not alter your comment 34 times. The person who did alter it, alter it 34 times and then sent me DMs on Discord as well, asking more questions and repeating some of the comments, which they deleted and then edited. Um, yeah. I love you dearly. I answer the questions. But in future... Might I suggest, for this person specifically, I'm doing this nicely, notepad. Okay? On your screen, or on an actual physical one, jot down your points as you're going, then if, cross them out if I answer them in the video, and then produce one massive comment at the end. I do know some people who do that, and I, we see them, I, I, I see them and I answer them. Hello. 
I think that's a good idea for you. Please. If you're watching this video, please. Because <laughs> that was the point at which I hadn't realized how to turn off the notification beep on my phone from YouTube. <laughs> and the notification going on, where if I had my phone normally on noise making, I've now figured it out. But it was basically beep, 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 and then I'm right, beep, oh, beep, again. Hello. Yes, you're, you're cute. Oh, it was fun. It was fun. You want a biscuit, don't you? One thing I could see happening is that Atreus Vanguard gets built as Battlecruiser, depending on how much work Hood and Repulse are going through in the early days, weeks and months of war. If the far ships are seeing a lot of work, then the British only have three of them in total, and only two in actual service could lead to a desire for more under RN control. Atreus Vanguard type ship, built as more of a battlecruiser than a fast battleship, could well be seen as the best option to get that ship into service quickly. Whilst a more complete ship is designed and built, that won't interfere too much with both the current and future fast battleships and aircraft carrier for construction. The need for another battlecruiser could get reinforced more by damage or loss of either hood or repulse early in the war. The latter being fairly unlikely, I admit. As for the Germany, I really can't decide. On one hand, the desire for prestige of retaking Singtau will be pretty attractive. On the other, the need for the German force to be fairly heavily supported will, I suspect, gall Hitler enough that he may decide it isn't worth it. The possibility of being able to have a more free hand in Europe while British and French are distracted could be fairly attractive as well. I could actually see a scenario where things in Europe progress pretty much as they did historically. Hitler thinking that any guarantees over Poland are posturing given the war against Japan. Italy will probably be allied with Britain and France at this point, though, but I doubt that would influence Hitler too much. Actually, it could influence Hitler more than you think, because, remember, he wouldn't have invaded... He wasn't going to do Anschluss with Austria until he was supported by Italy, until Italy gave him the go-ahead, because he was worried about the Italian military forces. Now, admittedly, that had already happened, but... There is the fact Italy is there. If you if you have you'd have a two front war automatically if you have Italy as part of the alliance. Hello. What do you want? You want to be the centre. You you think you have better hair than Il Duce. You do have better hair than Il Duce. Um. I'll be gone. Oh. That make you happy. That make you happy. So can I actually read the question? Can I read the question? Yes. Hello. Right then. So hopefully you can still hear me. <laughs> oh. Hello. <laughs> Hello, gorgeous. Yes, yeah, you're gorgeous. You're both a boy. You're both a boy. Oh. Oh. Like. Right. Um. One scenario could be well be that the Germans and Soviets invade Poland, as they did historically, and that leads to a declaration of war from Britain, France, and eventually the USA. They join Britain and France against Japan, and the Germans and Soviets miscalculated against the Germans and the Soviet Union. How would that play out? I can't see America being able to, let alone wanting to ship a large amount of troops to Europe. Britain was attacked by Japan, so that has to be the focus. I doubt the BFF is sent to reinforce France. Could it end up being France being left to sit on defense of Europe while Britain looks to deal with Japan whilst trying to contain Germany? What does Italy do? I suspect ne stay neutral in Europe initially, but France is failing, uh, falling, then what? Their fleet is partially surrounded by the RN in the Far East while their, border, uh, while their borders are getting German troops on them. That is a weird scenario to try and play out. Possibly a way to end up with an alter world or two where the Allies take a Japan first strategy and the Germans and Soviets are allied. What would that mean for places like Finland? Does the Norwegian campaign still happen if Germany has the Soviet Union as allied? Turkey, Italy, India? What happens between the Japanese and the Soviets in the Far East? Japanese, and honestly, I could see the Soviets actually joining in with that scenario with the Allies and attacking Soviet, attacking Japan. So it might mean Germany ends up even more isolated. And you go, I like the idea of a vanguard. Uh, uh, the, I think the idea of a vanguard was first proposed in March '39, at least according to Gaza and Dullin, as a way to create a fast capital ships in a hurry using the recycled components from Courageous class as well as potentially the R class. Um. Yes, there are uh, there are proposals for how to do it, but that's not. There's a proposal for creating a battleship in a hurry. It's not a design or even a design study. It's a. This is an idea. It then turns into something else, but it isn't really something else till after war begins. Stop licking my seat. It just you're licking off my. You you. My actual. 
armrest is Sodom. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right. Sorry. If you get bashed in the nose and a poor in the nose, you're gonna get weird stuff in your nose as well. I do know. I I I, I do remember once someone commenting, going, "Are you picking your nose or something?" No, no, no. It was just after I'd been bashed in the nose by the dog, and your nose feels weird. It's like earlier today he jumped up on me in a chair and put his paw on my larynx, doing that. I was like, ah, because you think you're light as anything and the perfect lap dog. I think I'm glad I don't have a St. Bernard. I'd currently be dead. <laughs> they did the same thing. Um, Finn Hager, wouldn't the 1939 40 US with an intact battleship fleet see a force, uh, an, a forcing an AO fight as the best solution? Why would the island hopping happen? Logistics. Basically, to try to move their fleet forward and give another Axis attack, you want to bring sustainment locations closer to your operations area. So, yeah they'd have to do logistics. And yes, they might want to force a, a battle fleet, but if they want to force it, they can do it. But the British aren't going to be there forcing it. The British are going to be doing this. As I said, it would be a combined plan at that point, and they'd have to work it through and work it out. Work it out. Also, they might already, you know, with that, they already have a route to the Philippines confirmed, so they could work things out. It, it could be a very interesting and different war, is basically... Uh, the broad scenario I was trying to put forward. You're doing your fluffy poodle. I'm looking gorgeous at myself on the screen. When you start preening yourself while looking at yourself in the cat in the screen, is quite disturbing. Steve Clark, Alex, you have explained elsewhere that the UK assessment was that there would be a European war in 1942-3. Production targeted at this. So my question is: whilst we know the projected historic Royal Navy. Um, Merchant Navy and USN navies were supposed to look like uh, Marine National and USN navies were supposed to look like. What changes would have been forced on those navies? Would the RN have had to look at long-range ships? Would the uh, Marine National actually start a sensible carrier? Would the USN um, have started the Montana class? Hello, you gorgeous boy, you gorgeous. Um, I'll pet you. What's your thing? Well, probably not on the longer-range ships for the British. After all, they're going up the South China Sea route, and it's yes, I've said war. Britain thinks wars in 1942-3. But that's not just war in Europe, that's war in the Far East as well. They think they're going to have a war either in Europe or the Far East by 1943 43 That's when they're thinking. If they end up, their whole scenario is hoping it's not both at the same time. Um, but those fast fleet orders will be completed and more than likely they'd actually get on to building the lions and the fleet carriers more quickly. Because there wouldn't be any pause in capital ship construction. So there'd actually probably be an acceleration of that capital ship construction for dealing with the Japanese war effort scenario. Um, USN might actually do the Montanas. It'll depend on the length of the war and the French carrier construction. Who knows? The experience of war may change the stars. And I tell you everyone, I was thinking about it and I have a hunch that not all the World War I ships will be disposed of by the time the European war begins afterwards. Uh, because disposing of them takes time. So whichever one survived the war against Japan will get used as they have life left and then need all the convoy escort ships, ships, the capital ships they can get. Potentially, but again, depends on what scenario you're dealing with. Because... If you're dealing with a war against Germany, yeah, you need combat sh uh, convoy ships, but that depends how many ships have they actually built by that point. And you're going to have more carriers available, so you may keep them, you may not. They might be just crew hogs at that point. Um, Morgoth's medic tr truck. Hello. This is Dr. D uh, Dr. C. Um, two questions. What if a few months into the blockade, the Soviet Union realizes the Japanese economy is collapsing and decides to take Manchuria? Uh, probably Britain does frigating all, but it's going to depend on what the Republic of China does uh, so, says about it, and if they're allied with them at the time. And uh, it's, you know, and second, how high does Admiral King's blood pressure get of the idea of helping the RN in the Far East? Uh, probably astronomical, but he would have to do it. Hello. Hello. Right, man. And, ooh. Christopher. Between the final battle... Featuring an international squadron of Dutch 1047 battle cruisers, Scharnhorst, North Carolina, Elitorio, and Hood, under the command of ABC, with Lee as the second in command. That is definitely a fan fiction being written there. 
and the Emperor surrendering, USSR declares war. The Western Allies are in no mood for a Soviet land grab or communist Japan. And USSR is told in no uncertain terms to go purge itself. This leads to an increased tension in Europe with the USSR financing leftist political violence and funding red terrorist groups across Europe. June 1947, while conducting a state visit to Romania, Hitler is assassinated by a communist terrorist organization known to be funded and trained by the Soviet Union. Goring declares war on the USSR later that month, seeing no way to gain either supremacy in the Baltic and forcing uh, forced a landing on the German Baltic coast. The Soviet Union decides to attack East Germany through Poland. German uh, Great Britain honors a treaty obligation to protect the Polish sovereignty, declares war on the USSR, followed shortly by France and three months later by Italy. America sees no reason to join another European war, started because someone got assassinated. RN Taranto's the USSR fleet. The rest of the war follows predictably with a total defeat of the USSR. The Red Army basically collapsing and mass defected soldiers to from the Baltic states, Ukraine and other poorly treated regions. Post-war the USSR is split up. The battleship soldiers on as there's still yet to be a major battle proving the ascendancy of the aircraft carrier. Reparations from the USSR prop up the empire, and especially the Raj, preventing any large-scale decolonization. US versus UK space race, eventually US versus UK Cold War. US forms alliance of North, Central, and South American states, which includes Argentina. In 1982, the Cold War between the US and, uh, US and UK goes hot when Argentina tries to regain control of the Falklands Islands. US and UK battle fleets deploy the Atlantic, supported on both sides by carrier aviation. We finally get a decisive naval battle which proves the severity of carrier over the battleship in the South Atlantic in 1982. Conqueror still sinks ARA Balgrano. I will agree, I concur with Knight 683 on. What? That's just, that's just a long one, is it? What do we think? That, do we think that's one paw for Long uh, for Longford or two paws? Which do we think? Oh, it's a full poodle replacement. Okay. Two, a, a full poodle replacement. Yeah. My nose is going to be funny all day now. And by the way, if you're wondering how I got whacked, I'm not sure if I said poor, but what I, uh, what I actually got was a full body whack in the nose. If it's t if it's red by the end of the day, because there's going to be a live recorded later, you know why. And remember, after the Thursday lives, I do this thing of popping into Discord, and this week it will have been the regular li a regular chat, I the open to everyone chat. But every other week, it's the um, kill it only chat, and the reason I do that is because it sort of it's a little benefit to the kill it sort of reward for them for the, all their hard work on the server, all their um, their content they produce, and, and on the server, if you promoted the kill it, it's recognition for the quality of the comments, the quality of the articles, the quality of your contributions, to discussions on the server. It's very much a sort of a, a, a recognition of quality, as it is in the Royal Navy. Being a killer is something good. Can Jonathan, hello. Chinese uh, American uh, ace Arthur Chin did fly Glossa Gladiator for the Republic of China Air Force during the early stages of the Second China Japanese War and shot down five A5Ms. Cool, I need you to send me a link. Captain Benjamin, question on Nerod Starship. Did any designs have unequal numbers of guns and turrets? For example, two guns in the first turret, three guns in the second and third turret. Also, if the RN had built, uh, been building sloops in the interwar, how much, uh, how much some of these planes? I find the fact that these vessels are allowed to have up to three seaplanes hilarious. And I've just read a question, uh, Q-ship Chameleon. Wonder how such a ship could, in our world, I guess that would be Toronto or Saint Nazaire. Um, and then it's the rest of your comments seems to have disappeared. Uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, unequal guns are something the Italians have built of battleships and cruisers, and the USN in cruisers, and the USN in battleships as well at some point. Uh, then the Vardas. Uh, but for reasons of logistics, it wasn't really light. The King George V system certainly caused even more issues than it would have been if they'd had three quadruple turrets. Or three triple turrets. Hello. Thank you, Wayne. Um, Geo Guy, Admiral Hirega and Fujimi team have some weird gun turret combinations in the late 20s, early 30s. Japanese designs for Congo fuser replacements, twin forward, triple super firing forward aft, twin aft. Yeah, there's lots of fun different ideas with turret turrets in design. And you were sorry, the website I was referring to was the Warships Project 1900-1950. That is an interesting website. Anyway, thank you very much everyone for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the comment response. Um, thank you for all your comments. Especially Glenn McLevy, because I, I do sometimes worry with you and sort of with Martin Peacock because you do such massive comments 
and you obviously put a lot of thought into them and a lot of research into them and I so I spent a lot of time discussing them but the trouble is I use them as a lot of bouncing points for different areas points of discussion and I never want you to think it's in any way meant to sort of critical but you're sort of how do I put this you have students in a class in a lecture theatre in especially in seminars there are some who are more confident in their points and go and do research and some who don't and so when you want to cover a lot of discursive ground you tend to pick on the ones who go and do their research because you can then have a nice long conversation with them. Me trying to squash me again. Um, and sort of that's what I have of you both. And thank you for them. And thank you, Nights of Gopher, and all the rest of you for commenting. It's always fun. Anyway, right. Toodles from the poodle. Eee. See you all live later. Well, this that live li the later live in my time will be oh. yesterday in your time. Yeah, well, have fun. Oh. No, you're not getting any more biscuits. No, just no. Your mother will kill me. You can look as adoring and lovely as you want. It's not happening. I like my limbs attached. She started threatening to actually watch the channel on a regular basis to see how many biscuits you get. 